Here we're continuing on our video series of the factorizations inside of integral domains, and we want to look at something called a principal ideal domain. So let's look at the definition. So an integral domain D is called a principal ideal domain, or shorthand PID, if every ideal in D is a principal ideal. So we'll recall in just a second what a principal ideal is. So on the channel before, we proved a couple special cases of principal ideals. In particular, we proved that the uh, ring, the integers, is a principal ideal and um, k adjoin x, where k is a field, is a principal ideal domain. So in other words, um, the ring of polynomials with uh, coefficients in a field, that's a principal ideal domain. Okay, so let's recall these three following uh, notions. So for a and d, really this can be in any uh, commutative ring with one, the principal ideal generated by A is notated like this, so angle brackets A, or sometimes just parentheses A, and that's equal to all, all multiples of A where we let R run through the whole ring, or the whole integral domain in this case. And then next, we say that an element P in D is irreducible if, when we factor P into A times B, A or B is a unit. And another subtle thing here is that P starts off being a non-unit, so I didn't write that there, but that's also important. And then also, a non-unit P is said to be prime if when P divides AB, we have P either divides A or P divides B. Okay, great. So we want to prove this lemma before we prove another result uh, regarding principal ideal domains, and that is if D is a PID and A and B are elements of D, then we have these three equivalences. So if A divides B, that's the same as, in other words, if and only if the principal ideal generated by B is a sub-ideal of the principal ideal generated by A, a and B are associates if and only if they generate the same principal ideal, and A is a unit if the ideal generated by A is the whole ring. Okay, so let's go ahead and see this proof. So we'll prove one first and we'll prove this forward direction. Um, so let's go ahead and suppose that A divides B. So what that tells us is that um, B equals A times R for some R in uh, the ring, or in other words, in uh, the PID in this case. Now the next thing we want to do is let's go ahead and let X be in the principal ideal generated by B. So that tells us that BX equals B times Y for some Y in the ring because that's what it takes to be in that principal ideal. But now we want to stick this equation inside of this equation. So that tells us that X equals A times R times Y, but that's most definitely an element of the principal ideal generated by A. So notice by element tracing, we started with an element in this principal ideal. We ended up with that element is in the principal ideal generated by A. In other words, we have the correct inclusion. Okay, good. Now let's go in the opposite direction. So that means we need to suppose that the ideal generated by B is a substructure of the ideal generated by A. But what that tells us is that um, the element B is in the ideal generated by A because everything in B is in the ideal generated by A, so the element B is. But what that tells us is that B equals AR for some R in D, but that's exactly what it takes to say uh, that A divides B. Great. So we've proven part one. Now I'll clean it up and we'll prove part two. We just got done proving part one, now let's prove part two. Again, this is an if and only if statement, so we have two things to prove. Let's do the forward direction first. So let's go ahead and suppose that A and D are associates. So recall, that means that there exists a unit U in D, recall that a unit is just an invertible element. I should have say uh, an element with a multiplicative inverse. Um, and so there exists a unit such that A equals B times U. So being associates means they differ by a unit. 
So now from this, we can say that C that B divides A, which tells us by part one, the principal ideal generated by A is a substructure of the ideal generated by B. Now we can take this equation and multiply by U inverse on the right, because we know we have a unit here. So there is a un inverse. So A times U inverse equals B, but that's the same thing as saying that A divides B, which means that the ideal generated by A is a substructure of the ideal, which means the ideal generated by B is a subobject of the ideal generated by A. But now, if we put these two together, that means the ideal generated by A is equal to the ideal generated by B, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Let's go ahead and do the reverse direction. So we want to start off uh, supposing that the ideal generated by A is equal to the ideal generated by B. But notice that means that the ideal generated by A is a uh, subset of the ideal generated by B and vice versa. So the ideal generated by B is a subset of the ideal generated by A. But now we want to apply part one again. That tells us that A divides B and B divides A. But this one tells us that B equals AX, and this one tells us that um, A equals BY. But now we can put these together to get uh, this following kind of nice equation. We can get B equals, now we'll replace A with B times Y, so we'll get B times XY, where I've commuted. So we have B equals B times XY, but then by the cancellation rule in integral domains, we can say that this means 1 equals XY, which tells us that X is a unit. But notice if X is a unit, and we have this right here, that means that A and B are associates because they differ multiplicatively um, by a unit, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, we just got done proving parts one and two. Now we're ready to prove part three. That says that A is a unit if and only if the ideal generated by A is equal to the entire ring D. So let's go ahead and do this forward direction first. So let's go ahead and suppose that A is a unit so notice what that gives us is the following. Um, so A inverse exists. So in other words, it has a multiplicative inverse. Now the next thing we want to do is uh, suppose we've got an arbitrary element from D. So uh, let's take an arbitrary element X from D and we can write this arbitrary element X in this kind of weird way. We can write X as X times one, which is the same thing as X times A inverse times A. Because again, A inverse exists and A inverse has the property that A times A inverse is one and I've used associativity here, but writing it like this, we see that that is an element of the principal ideal generated by A, which tells us that the entire ring is a subring of the principal ideal generated by A, but we know that ideals are already subrings of the whole ring, so that means we've sandwiched this ideal a between the ring and itself. And so in other words, um, we have D equals this whole thing. Okay, good. Now let's do the other direction. So in other words, we want to suppose that the entire ring is generated by A as this ideal. And in particular, since D has an element one, we know that one is an element of A. So that means one is some multiple of A. So there exists um, a B in D such that A times B equals one, but that's exactly what it takes for A to be a unit. So A is a unit. In other words, we found this A inverse, we just called it B.
Okay, good. So we finished the proof of this lemma. I'm gonna clean up the board and we're gonna look at a theorem that builds off of this. Building off our lemma, we're gonna look at the following kind of bigger result, which has a really important corollary. And this says that if D is a PID and we consider this ideal, which is not the zero ideal, then P is a maximal ideal if and only if uh, P is irreducible. And over here I should say the ideal generated by P is a maximal ideal. And over there P as an element is irreducible. Let's recall what it means to be irreducible. It means that if you can factor P into two things, then one of them has to be a unit. Okay, great. So this is an if and only if proof again. So that means we have two directions to do. So let's look at the forward direction. So let's suppose that P is a maximal ideal. Good. And then suppose we've got some sort of factorization of P. And P equals A times B. And notice our goal here is to show that P is irreducible. In other words, A or B is a unit. But notice what this equation tells us, P equals A times B, that tells us that A divides P, okay? But then if A divides P, then we've got some sort of ordering on the ideals. Um, we have uh, the ideal generated by P um, is a subobject of the ideal generated by A, which is a subobject of the whole ring D. Great. But then, by the definition of a maximal ideal, if we've got an ideal between a maximal ideal and the whole ring, then that means there are two cases. Either our ideal is the maximal ideal, or this new ideal is the whole ring, okay? So now, let's look at this case first. So if P, the ideal generated by P is the ideal generated by A, then that means that P and A are associates. But if P and A are associates, then that means B is a unit because uh, the definition of being an associate is they differ by a unit. So here, they're differing by something, but since they're associates, that has to be a unit. Great, and then now let's look at this other case. So the other case is that ideal generated by A is the whole ring, but again, by our lemma, that means A is a unit. So let's see what we've got. Down this case, we get B as a unit. Down this case, we get A as a unit. But that's exactly what our goal was. So in other words, P is irreducible. Finishing this first direction of our proof. All right, let's go ahead and look at the other direction. Okay, so for the other direction, we want to start assuming that P is irreducible. So let's suppose uh, P is irreducible. And we want to end with the ideal generated by P is maximal, which means we're going to want to put an ideal between the one generated by P and the whole ring and show that that is either one or the other. So let's consider um, A in D with the ideal generated by P is contained in the one generated by A, which is contained in the whole ring. And in general, you would put an arbitrary ideal here, which you would call I, but since we know this is a PID, any arbitrary ideal is generated by a single element, so we're good to go here. So now, notice by our lemma, this means that A divides P. In other words, that means that P equals A times B for some B in D. Great. But then, since P is irreducible, that tells us that A or B is a unit. So A is a unit or B is a unit. So let's look at each of those cases and see how that when put together, those will tell us that we do have a maximal ideal. So if A is a unit, Again, by that lemma, that tells us that the ideal generated by A is the whole ring D.
Great. Now, if B is a unit, that means that P and A are associates. That's the definition of being associates. So P and A are associates, but recall in that previous lemma that if they're associates, they generate the same ideal. So we have the ideal generated by P is equal to the ideal generated by A. So let's see what we tried to do. We tried to put an ideal between P and D, and we ended up with it's either the whole ring or it's our original ideal. But that's exactly the definition of this ideal generated by P is maximal, which is what we wanted. Okay, so now we're done, done with this proof, and then we're going to look at a really important corollary. Okay, so an important corollary to this is that if you've got a PID, the notion of an element being irreducible is the same as the element being a prime. So in an arbitrary ring, this is not the case. So in an arbitrary ring, the notion of being a prime is more restrictive than the notion of being irreducible. And in fact, a couple of videos back, we found elements that were irreducible that were not prime. Um, okay. Great, but in this case, if you have a PID, these notions are the same, and that's what this corollary is saying. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the proof of this. So let's uh, suppose P is irreducible, and then go ahead and look what it takes to be prime. So to be prime, if P divides AB, then P divides A, or P divides B. So what our setup needs to be is that P divides some product AB, and what we want to show is that P divides A or P divides B. That would end the condition of primeness. Okay, so now let's see how this goes. If P divides AB, then that means that AB equals P times R for some R in the ring. So that's just the definition of divisibility. But what that tells us is that AB is in the ideal generated by P. But the next thing that we know is that this ideal generated by P is a maximal ideal by this theorem. So let's write that down. So this is a maximal ideal. But by something we proved a long time ago is that a maximal ideal implies that it's a prime ideal. Great. So I'll let you guys look up the definition of a prime ideal, but we're about to see it in action. But this being a prime ideal means that if A, B is in the ideal, then A is in the ideal or B is in the ideal. But let's see what each of those gives us. This means A equals PX, which is the same thing as P divides A, or this one means B equals PY, but that means that P divides B, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, great. So this is a really important theorem and corollary that shows that in PIDs, irreducibility and primeness are the same. That's a good place to stop.